Who is this mysterious man looking upward, mouth agape, odd things reflected in his glasses, odd things reflected before his very face? Who is this guy, and what's he doing here on your Facebook? What's the meaning of this? What's the purpose of all this? What could possibly be happening? Well, I'm going to tell you right now. Some of, you, some of you people don't need to be told. Some of you people know already because you've got calendars that work. You've got watches that work. You're able to exercise your somewhat short-term memory and know that if it's something like this happening on the Internet, it must be Wednesday, it must be 7 p.m., and it must be that little old record collector, video blogger, fanatical hoarder me Malcolm Tent with the latest yay perhaps even the greatest certainly uh, the one that's got the uh, least mobility right now due to a guitar cable laying on the floor episode of Tent Talks Tunes yes keeping the spirit of cable access TV alive the very fact that I could not move my chair backwards, <coughs> excuse me, without being speed bumped by a guitar cable. Boy, you people should see the, <coughs> excuse me, damn it, see the mayhem that surrounds me. You would not believe it. You know, I could actually reach over right here and pull over something that's off camera that you would not be able to see. That is my improvised music stand that's a, uh, in case you're curious to know, that is actually a uh, mic stand with a clip on it and some lyrics. We do have the aforementioned cable laying all over the floor. Over here to my right, we've got the guitar that is plugged into that cable. If you look over there, you'll see more lyric sheets and you'll see a set list mysterious and enigmatic set list and if you look behind the backdrop you'll see guitar amps and effects pedals and all kinds of groovy stuff the reason being that lord willing and the creeks don't rise in 24 hours time my nose will be pointed directly westward as i burn it on down the line to cleveland ohio for the 22nd annual devotional Devo fan gathering. There's a flyer for it right there, kids. Devotional Devo fan gathering. Woohoo! The first toast of Danbury Tap is drunk to the devotional Devo fan gathering. <laughs> Love that Mercury fortified Danbury Tap. That is some good stuff. Lots of heavy metal. Mm, mm, mm. I have attended all except one of the devotionals since 1999, and I have performed at quite a few of them, and I'm actually performing at the one this weekend. Fr <coughs> Excuse me, guys. I'm still getting over this cold I picked up <coughs> a couple of weeks ago. It boomeranged back around and hit me in the back of the head a few days ago, and... Um, you know, just when you think you're totally over it, you're not. And I'm going to straighten out my angle a little bit. Once again, in the spirit of classic cable access television, where we do all this stuff on the fly, in the real, in the raw. I don't know, I just might have to go crooked this day, this time, kids. I don't know what the F is happening here. Eh, you know, life is a little bit crooked, isn't it? So we'll just have to... Have you guys sit like this and look at me that way? So yeah, devotional. I will be on stage at the Beachland Ballroom in Cleveland, Ohio, 7 p.m. Friday, doing a set of very special, hand-selected, personally curated, unwanted Devo songs. What does that mean? That means I'm going to be playing a grand total of seven, count them, seven extremely unpopular 
disliked, dismissed, disrespected, maybe even diseased Devo songs. So we all know the popular favorites. You know, we all know Whip It and Uncontrollable Urge and Beautiful World and That's Good and Are You Experienced and Smart Patrol, Freedom of Choice. We already know those. We know them very well. But what about those songs that get the short shrift by the fans and the critics? Those songs don't get nearly enough attention nor nearly, nearly enough love. That's why I'm devoting my entire set to the songs that the critics and the fans basically pinch their noses at whenever they come up in conversation and some of the <coughs> myriad almost endless debates over Devo songs on the Devo fan groups. <clears throat> I picked seven of them and I'm going to be doing them all this Friday at Devotional. So put that in your energy dome and let it cascade up and down throughout your organism. Because that's what an energy dome does. Yes, we have just addressed one item on the bulletin board. I'm going to address the issue of the monitor and make sure that we are indeed going out live. Yes, we are going out live. We got comments. We got hearts. We got smiley faces. We got me. You can hear me coughing on an endless feedback. We got Dwayne from Australia. We got... Mr. Bruiser Braswell, formerly of uh, Macon, Georgia, currently of Hickory, North Carolina, saying howdy. Bruiser wants to know, how's the hoof? The hoof is actually getting a lot better. We are into uh, week number eight of post-surgery recovery for the hoof. I'm in a brace, which I can loosen up and tighten as needed. I actually take it off for uh, several hours every day, just so the skin can breathe a little bit. And... Um, yeah, if all goes well, this thing will be coming off completely in four weeks. And uh, the doctors say, once it's off, I'm good to go, baby. And it's it's not doing bad at all. There's uh, The pain is minimal. The swelling has been down for a while. My dexterity and strength are coming back. I definitely, here, I'll even show you guys. I have enough moxie in the hoof to pick up the guitar and... Um, play just a little bit and that was not a song I'll be playing on Friday night at the devotional promise now this angle is really starting to bug me because I'm looking at it on my computer screen and I'm starting to feel kind of crooked and by cracky I cannot get it to straighten up what goes on here man all right that's better that's better yay Let's see who else is tuned in. We got James Pogo. Now, James wants to know what's my favorite Devo song. Oh, my God. Whew, that is something that changes uh, by the second, by the nanosecond. I'm not going to tell you what my least favorite Devo song is. You're going to have to come to Devotional on Friday and find out for yourself when I play it live on stage. My favorite Devo song right here, right now, this nanosecond, I'm going to pluck one out of the air. Ah, I knew it was going to be this one. A song called Please, Please from the extremely reviled Shout album. And that's another bone of contention amongst the devotees. I love Shout as an album. I really, really do. It's bizarre sounding, like the production on it is really weird and off-kilter. The drum sounds are completely synthetic and unnatural. But somehow, I really, really like it. It totally comes together. If, if you just want an album by Devo to put on and play without having to think about it too much or absorb too much information, or for driving, for example, Shout is like my go-to album to listen to when I'm driving. It just sounds so good when you're on the road. Pointed West towards Devotional, for example. In fact, it's one of those things, whenever I'm driving all the way across Pennsylvania and I hit the state line between Pennsylvania and Ohio, I almost always automatically reach into the CD player for a Devo record, and 19 times out of 20, it's Shout. The, the, the heraldic synthetic trumpet intro, the synthetic saxophones that open up the title song, just says, you're here, boy. You're in the spiritual homeland of de-evolution. 
Salute. Rise to the anthem. So shout in that song called Please Please. I really love that song. It's just a good song. It's just a plain darn old good song. And um, what's yours, James Pogo? Enough of me. What's your favorite song? What's your favorite Devo song? What about all you other people who are watching? I see you've got names and icons. What are your favorite Devo songs? My inquiring mind wants to know. Bob Eaton, Tom, Greg, Sophia, Benjamin, what are your favorite songs? Dwayne, certainly in Australia, you've got a favorite Devo song. Devo were huge in Australia for a little while there. It was a big tour they did in 1982. What are your favorite Devo songs? Post them and let me know. I love reading the results of these polls here on Tent Talks Tunes. So that's one item on the bulletin board. Just check that one right off. Another item on the bulletin board. <coughs> Solo acoustic tour. Myself, my good pal Tim Holhouse. You can kind of see in caricature there. We are touring from October 12th to the 18th. We are starting at Molten Java in Bethel, Connecticut on the 12th. And we are ending up in, I believe, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania on the 19th. If you go to my website, malcolmtent.net, you will see the tour dates posted. Other locations include Bell Tower Records in Adams, Massachusetts. Willimantic Records in Willimantic, Connecticut. And all points in between. So Solo Acoustic Tour... You know you don't want to miss that. How about full-blown electric mayhem? You get a whole bunch of professional wrestling alpha males on stage, and what do you do? You call it anti-scene. And we have a run of shows, November 3rd, 4th, and 5th, in Wilmington, North Carolina, Jacksonville, Florida, and Tampa, Florida. And, <coughs> excuse me, details are TBA, but the... <coughs> Sorry, guys. I don't mean to keep coughing in your face like that, but throat is very dry and scratchy because of this <coughs> very simple, very annoying common cold I picked up. Mm. But that good merc mercury-infused Danbury tap will certainly lubricate the pipes enough for me to keep talking at you. Um, odds are good. Details are to be announced about another run of anti-scene shows between November 13th and approximately the 23rd in the sunny south. Can't say exactly who with yet. Can't tell you the exact dates yet. But keep your eye open and glued to this here social media jive so you can find out. And of course, let's not forget the Danbury Record and CD Expo November 5th. A room full of dealers, crammed full of records, tapes, and CDs. New, used, collectible, rare, cheap, common, hideously impossible to find. Danbury, November 5th. There is an event page on Facebook, and there's a flyer for it on my website. So if you don't know about it, don't blame Desinex. I see we got all kinds of uh, comments here. Ah, look at that. Ooh, a lot of people got some things about uh, their favorite Devo songs. Yeah. Shannon, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, what's your favorite Devo song? And by the way, Shannon Naff, an old pal of mine who used to live in um, Marion, Virginia, he had a band called TSA. And before that was a government agency, it was a band name that stood for The Sarcastic Assholes. Shannon, you will love this. I was recently digitizing a bunch of old hardcore demos for a friend of mine, all of most of which were copied from one generation to another. And on this very old, very ancient mixtape of old copied demos was, you guessed it, TSA, second demo. Sheep are fun. This thing was probably 15th generation on an old cassette with layers and layers and layers of tape hiss. And I saw that tape and was like, hey, I know those guys. I know those guys. Shannon, if you're watching still and listening, can you make a comment and let me know if the TSA anthology is still available? And if it is, post a link to it, because I think people should know about it. The Sarcastic Assholes, hardcore from Marion, Virginia in 1984-85. And if you want to know why that's special, 
without using Google Maps or any kind of internet search, try to find Virginia. Try to find Marion, Virginia on a map without any outside help. And imagine a hardcore band coming from there in the 1980s. Pretty cool stuff. So there, a salute to my old pal Shannon and TSA. Got one mail item, one mailbox item. Let me reach over here and grab it for you. <coughs> from my boss in the almighty anti-scene, the unimpeachable president for life, the heel prez himself, Jeff Clayton. I found a soft envelope. Right there it is. Now, Copernicus Tent, P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470. <laughs> I think Mal Copernicus Tent might be the best one yet. That's my mailing address. And it's also the, the Telltale Return Address Stickers, man. Sunny and Cher. Anti-scene, of course. Let's open it up and see what we got. I don't do a whole lot in the way of cold openings, but I trust Jeff Clayton. I trust the man implicitly. I know that whatever it is in this envelope, it is internet safe to open here and open now. Kind of reminds me of Devo song, Soft Things, inside this envelope. We reach in, sight unseen, sound unheard, and pull out a big wad of stuff. Oh my god. Oh, yes. Okay. JC, if you're watching, I was gonna I was gonna ask you for a couple of these things, but I didn't I felt a little bit shy about doing it, but you've taken care of that without my even asking. First of all, brand new hot off the presses anti-scene t-shirt. The Kings of Destructo Rock, that's us, featuring the Possum of Judah logo, drawn by our good pal Jamie Vida, top shelf artist, and on the back. <clears throat> the soon-to-be world-renowned trademark of Destructo logo. Drawn by another one of my favorite artists, Frank Oblack from Cleveland, Ohio. Concept by me. The Minister of Pra, Pa, Gan, Da for Anti-Scene Incorporated. So I'll be sporting this proudly. Thank you, JC, Jeff Clayton, for sending me this. And if you people want one for yourselves, uh, you're out of luck because you can't get one for free, but you're in luck because if you go to antiscene.com, you can order some of this, I think. I might be speaking out of turn. This might have been a pre-sale only item. Might have been pre-sale only, so... Go to antiscene.com and check and make sure. Even if, even if this one in particular is not available, there's a ton of other good stuff that is available from the band that I'm in. And it's celebrating its 40th anniversary next year. And here I was hoping, man, I was really hoping. I was, I was uh, too nervous to ask, but here they are. Some of the last remaining anti-scene voodoo dolls. Yes, genuine authentic voodoo dolls of Sir Barry Hannibal shown here holding a bass he is now the drummer for Anti-Scene and the late great Joe Young holding his giant electric buzz saw these are going to look really good on my pretty shelf thank you Jeff for sending these to your long serving and as far as I'm concerned last ever bass guitar player that's me. Woo! I love rock and roll. <coughs> A toast of Danbury Tap to rock and roll. All right, people. It's time to talk tunes. I've already told you about how I'm going to devotional in just a couple of days, and I just figured it'd be a lot of fun to go to my the aforementioned pretty shelf and take down a bunch of the, the Devo artifacts that I have. Not records, tapes, or CDs, but Devo spud was, such as it were. Periphery, ephemerals. I opened up using this screen teaser. This is my most recent acquisition, and this is a gift from my pals Kate and Will. I recently officiated their wedding, and it was a lovely ceremony. 
Kate and Will are good people. I've known Kate especially for a very, very long time. She's one of the original customers in my store, Trash American Style. Kate goes way back to the Brookfield days. And so it was a really cool wedding, nice people, good people. And at the end of the day, they gifted me with this original 1988 Devo poster from San Francisco. And uh, framed in everything, beautifully framed, beautifully preserved. I love this. So thank you, Kate and Will, for this dynamite poster. I've got a spot on my living room wall where it will be hanging very soon. So that's an example of some Devo Spud Waz that I have in my home. Some of the stuff I've got laying around might be kind of obvious. Um, if you're in my living room and you're looking at my stereo, which is, you know, it's a real stereo, a good old-fashioned, honest-to-God stereo with a, a receiver, a record player, and two great big speakers. If you look at the top shelf of my home entertainment union, you've got unit, you've got a speaker, the receiver, and another speaker. On top of each speaker and the receiver is a Devo Energy Dome. I've got three different ones. I've got a blue something for everybody energy dome. A black, you know, I should show this to you guys, actually. It didn't even, it didn't even occur to me to drag this down. <laughs> this other Devo energy dome I have is literally one of a kind. I want to show it to you. Stay tuned. Don't go away. It's a little bit dusty. It's kind of like an Elton John song. It's a little bit dusty, but it is an actual uncut plastic mold Devo Energy Dome. This is the this is exactly as it comes off of the vacuum form press before it's cut. And I don't know if they actually made a run of black Energy Domes or if they were going to be colored somehow later. I'm not sure. <laughs> Excuse me, but that sits on the receiver of my home entertainment unit. Uncut energy dome. And then sitting on one of the speakers is this original red energy dome. The, the energy dome has been reissued and remanufactured many times over the years, but only the very original ones from 1980 have the embossed lettering on top with the uh, 1980 copyright notice. And I'm pretty sure it gives credit to Brent Scrivener for uh, design. Oh no, 1980 Devo Inc. So that's how you can tell a Stone Cold original. And also the, uh, the proportions on the originals are different from the reissues. You can even see it here if you look at the... You can totally see the difference in the proportions, especially on the bottom layer on the originals between the reissues. And of course the reissue you can see does not have the Devo or the copyright on top. So this is um, technically not the original Energy Dome that I bought at my very, very, very first ever concert, which was Devo in 1980. I bought one of these off of the merch table at my first ever Devo concert. I wore it to my second ever Devo concert in 1981 and some scumbag stole it right off the top of my head. I remember very clearly standing at the merch table for the 1981 Devo tour, and some asshole dressed up in a boogie boy outfit just did a drive-by, ran by, ripped it off my head, and ran out the door. And I was just like too shell-shocked to even give chase to the idiot, so that, that motherfucker got my energy gnome. So I had to mail order another one, from Club Devo in early 1982, which arrived to me in the mail in a great big cardboard box. And this is the one that I've had for all those years. Second generation original. But it has survived all this time. As you can see, it's definitely uh, a little bit worse for wear. It was glued to the head of a mannequin in my living room for a long time. But it's still intact. It's still an original, and it's still mine. It is the direct descendant of the one that I bought at that very first Devo concert, which was my very first concert by any band ever. 
pretty good way to start a concert going career, eh? I'll drink to that. What other kind of interesting artifacts do we have? Well, this is another thing from 1981. I never bought one of these at the time, but this. New Traditionalists JFK Pomp. I don't like to wear this too much or even take it off the shelf too much because it's very fragile. It's very thin and um, it's already started to tear around certain parts of it, but it does look good. Very stylish. Very, very elegant. A real hairdo. Not a hair don't. I feel like a brand new man wearing this thing. I kind of like it. Maybe I'll never take it off. That might be a good idea. But this one, even though I didn't buy it in 1981, I got it sometime in the 1980s. Pretty sure I saw uh, an auction in Goldmine magazine. And somebody was offering this on auction, and I ended up getting it fairly inexpensively. You know, back when Devo wasn't cool. So thank you, American public, for thinking that Devo was not cool for a long time. You made it easier for me to get my JFK pomp at a discount price. We're going to very delicately place this one back on the desk. Speaking of when Devo wasn't cool, there was a time when Devo, and this sort of gets back to the set that I'm going to be playing, and I'm not dropping any hints. <coughs> I'm not going to be the spoiler. But I will say that there was definitely a time and a place when Devo was not considered cool. And there were a couple of albums that Devo released right in the middle of this uncool vortex. And one of them was a record called Smooth Noodle Maps. And the, um, the record label that Devo was on at the time was Enigma Records. And Enigma, they were basically a glorified independent label. Now, Devo, of course, spend a lot of time totally disrespecting Enigma. And I'm sure they've got, you know, the real insider's view of, as to exactly why Enigma Records was a complete horror story. From those of us on the demand side, Enigma was actually kind of a cool label. They had a lot of really good bands. Um, they got the product out. I mean, who did they have? They had Sonic Youth. They had the Smithereens. They distributed uh, Restless Records, which meant they had Dead Milkman albums. They had a David Cassidy record. I mean, they really, from you know, from from the consumer's perspective, perspective, had a really good presence in the marketplace and had a pretty good roster and a very definite, distinct look. So Devo ending up on Enigma, from our perspective, was not disgraceful. It was not a terrible thing. I mean, yes, it was definitely a step down from being on Warner Brothers Records. But it wasn't horrible. It's like Enigma was just another big independent label. Nothing wrong with that. And, um, you know, it turns out, I guess, that Enigma really had no marketing clout. <coughs> Excuse me. And there were the, the usual allegations of improprieties and all that. I don't know anything about that. But Enigma folded unceremoniously uh, when Devo was trying to promote their second album, Smooth Noodle Maps. Enigma did stay afloat long enough to send out a whole bunch of these Devo, I guess they're supposed to be smooth noodle maps, like 3D smooth noodle maps, this being in the era before digital 3D printing. They have these things manufactured out of plastic. Some would call them Frisbees, but they are definitely supposed to be Devo smooth noodle maps. I remember getting one of these at the record store, Trash American style, that I used to own. I remember getting one of these in a big padded envelope one day uh, when Enigma obviously was still in business and they were doing promo for the album. And then sometime later, and I don't remember the exact circumstances, but I seem to remember that it was an Enigma sales rep that I had who said, we're going under, would you like some more of these Devo Frisbees? I said, sure. And they sent me like a, stack of them. I got a, I, at one time I had a whole, a whole bunch of these things. To this day now I still have two of them. 
And if you uh, have been one of those fine, classy lovers of art who have seen my photography book, my second volume of devolved female photography called Total Devo Women, you will see that these very, very smooth noodle maps were used as a prop in one of my favorite photos from that book. These are the ones. These touched genuine female flesh. How's that for a selling point? As to what happened to the rest of them, I just sold them off over the years. <coughs> you know, I, I, I probably had like a dozen of them. So when you've got a dozen of these things, you're not really going too far out of your way to keep every single for Schlugen or one of them. So I sold them off. I traded a few to other devotees. They all found good homes. Something else that arrived in an, en in an envelope from Enigma Records was this. And this is just, this shows you the, the genius of marketing why, and why it's so much fun to collect this stuff from the record companies. The Devo, a change is going to come. Plastic change purse. Hi. Hey. I'm the Devo change purse. Hi. <laughs> so you can have all kinds of funds with something like this. This is endless, endless hours of entertainment. At one point, I was interviewing Bob Casali the late and great rhythm guitarist and um, chief technician of Devo. And we were talking about the Enigma years a little bit. And I said, yeah, I got these changes going to come change purses. And he just burst out laughing. He thought it was about the funniest thing he'd ever heard <laughs> because it was so absurd, you know. And um, I didn't get a whole box of these. At one point I had two of these. And I'm pretty sure that Chief Spud Michael Pilmer, the guy who runs Devo's website, I'm pretty sure he got the other one. So you know it definitely found a good home. And if you guys want to see some real Devo Obsesso, if you think I got it bad, or maybe you even think you got it bad, look up the website DevoObsesso.com. That is an online inventory of Michael Pilmer's personal Devo collection. Just be prepared to spend a lot of time there. If you're the type of person who is really wanting to delve into the rabbit hole and take the deep dive, DivaObsesso.com. I guarantee you'll be there for a while. A toast to Michael Pilmer, a good spud. Ah, boy, I feel that mercury settling right into my larynx. Let's see who else is uh, in there. Ah, Nick! Nick Chalsulo, the guy who is promoting the devotional, and I think everybody out there should give a big thumbs up or a heart. How about a thumbs up and a heart for Nick? Nick is the hardest working man in Devo business, second perhaps only to Michael Pilmer. Nick is running the devotional this weekend. He's been in charge of it for a very long time. He's done an ace bitchin' job. So salute to you, Nick. And Nick says that he never got the change purse. Few did. It was only those of us who were lucky enough to own record stores at that very minute that Enigma was going out of business. We're the only ones who got them. James Pogo does mention, true fact, that um, Enigma gave Striper to the world. Now, did I see somebody? Oh, Nick gave a thumbs down. <laughs> Such a humble guy. Um, yep, Striper. We're not going to talk about Striper. Um, I know people who really like Striper an awful lot, so I ain't going to say nothing. What other kind of fine, fun Devo artifacts do we have? Well, this is the kind of thing that if you ever went to a county fair, you would recognize this back in the 1980s. And this was a, a real big deal here in Danbury, because for Danbury... The big deal every year was the Danbury Fair. It ran every autumn, every year, and it was like the big agricultural fun fair. It had everything from livestock to, you know, oxen pulling contests, you know, giant pumpkins, all that good stuff. And, of course, a great big old midway with rides and, you know, all, all, the, all the great things that make a fair a fair. And the Danbury Fair ran for many, many, many years. And, of course, you know, if you go to the, the fair and you play on the midway, you've got the games. You know, knock over a pile of cans, get a prize. 
Quite often the prize was something like this. A giant tumbler with a band name stenciled on it. And in this case, you got it, kids. Devo. This was probably from the summer of 1980. Autumn of 1980 when Devo was uh, big enough to appear on a tumbler to be given away at the fair. Let me see if I can... Um, we will use the anti-scene Devo as... Uh, anti-scene t-shirt as kind of a negative space prop. So you can see the... The stellar paint job on this. Check it out. It's got a star. It's got another star. It's got a lot of stars. It's Devo on a giant tumbler. Yes. You squirted the water gun into the clown's mouth and the balloon inflated and it popped and you won <coughs> a Devo tumbler. And here it is. I had certain, same deal, I had two of these at one point because, you know, the Danbury Fair was such a big deal that fair glass, as they call this kind of stuff, was everywhere. Every thrift shop, every yard sale, every uh, tag sale, I mean, you name it. The flea market, the Danbury Fair ephemera like that was just all over the place for the longest time. And usually when you would see a glass like this, it was Sammy Hagar or Fleetwood Mac or... Mahogany Rush. But this one says Devo. And I am willing to bet the farm that Michael Pilmer also got my spare Devo tumbler. Pretty sure he got that one. Here's something I found randomly in the wild. Check this out. The lenses are missing, but these are authentic Devo 3D glasses yes the magic viewer 3d glasses the story is that devo found like a gigantic quantity of these things in a, a surplus store somewhere they had the black lenses on them and just like bought the whole lot and used them for stage wear especially on their first tour and uh, it's, it's like very, it's thin cardboard, it's hinged, uh, very fragile. The lens has popped off a long time ago, but these are the real frames of the 3D Magic Viewers. <coughs> Excuse me, as appropriated culturally by Devo, and I got one on my pretty shelf. Mm -hmm. What else have we got? Oh, we got oh, we got all kinds of cool stuff here. I'm saving some of the super duper hard hitting ones for last this is not exactly Devo well I mean I guess it is Devo but it's uh, actually well okay this is Devo these other things are not exactly Devo just got all tongue tied there for a second live on Tent Talks Tunes this is Devo and I said <coughs> excuse me no records or tapes but how about Betamax tape a beta tape. Back in the good old days when you had the competing formats of VHS versus beta, beta was Sony's proprietary video format. They did not share the technology with anybody. And as a result, nobody bought it. Because you could get VHS players made by anybody and everybody. Beta you could only get from Sony. So beta was a rather short-lived format. I know people who swear by it, who say that it's a superior video format. I have never seen any evidence to support that. I'm a VHS man myself. But for a while, you get stuff like this. Video LPs. They also had video 45s. That is We're All Devo. On the late, unlamented beta format. And I do have a beta player. I just don't feel like popping this in to see if it plays or not, because if it doesn't play, it might get mutilated, and I don't want it to get mutilated. Now, Devo took a lot of cues from fine literature, or maybe coarse literature, as the case may be. Now, a lot of you people out, a lot of you people out there know the Devo album, Freedom of Choice. And maybe you know the refrain of the song, Freedom of Choice is what you got, Freedom from choice is what you want. 
Where did that refrain come from? From the great philosopher Eric Fromm in his book Escape from Freedom. Yes, the principle is that, well, to say it again, <coughs> excuse me, freedom of choice is what you got, but freedom from choice is what you want. And here's an entire book explaining that concept. And this is, you know, not the very book that was read by Devo, but it is from, most likely, the very run of books that they read. When was this thing printed? 1948, I think? Hmm, here's the catchphrase. Freedom is frightening. Why? A psychologist, ex ex a psychologist examines modern man's choice between flight to authoritarianism and the achievement of democracy. That definitely sounds like something from the era of the time. Eric Fromm, 1941, baby. Hmm, this is a first printing, it looks like. Not bad, not bad. I guess I better keep this one. But yes, there it is. The source and inspiration of freedom of choice is what you got. Freedom from choice is what you want. <clears throat> this book here, haha, <laughs> eagle-eyed spuds will recognize this one. Anybody out there who has actually seen, if you've seen this, if you've seen We're All Devo, you've seen this. And I'm not going to explain any more than that. Not going to explain any more than that, except that if you've seen this, you've seen this. Yeah, I got an actual hard copy. <laughs> I love being me. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. A toast to me. <laughs> gloat, gloat, gloat. All right. <clears throat> Here's another thing. Another thing. Speaking of the Devo Enigma years, the second of three albums that Devo released on Enigma, and I know, I know I said earlier there were only two, but really there were three. There were two studio albums and one live album. When I saw the cover of the live album, I said, this is the ugliest, stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. Be, and the reason was because Devo... As they always did, they always released their albums, their videos, their screeds without any context. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me again. <coughs> without any context or any explanation. They simply took whatever bizarre looking product that they had and put it out before the public and let the, the public figure it out. So I didn't know what was going on when I saw the live album entitled Now It Can Be Told. I just thought it was a dumb, ugly, poorly laid out album cover with a, 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 a shitty font. Little did I know that the joke was on me, as the joke has always been on those who are not in Devo, I should have known that they lifted those graphics, font and all, lock, stock, and barrel, the cover, the color, everything. From this book right here, The Beginning Was the End by Oscar Kiss My Arth. The first time I saw this book, I said, oh my god, now it makes sense. And this also is a book that contains many, many, many key precursors to Devo philosophy. The essential idea is that human beings are descendants of cannibalistic brain-eating apes. And that all of our problems can be explained by that theory. Brothers and sisters, it makes perfect sense to me. I am probably the last guy on the block who's going to argue with that. Genetic defective descendants of cannibalistic brain-eating apes. <clears throat> that is at least as good 
as God took a rib from Adam and created woman. At least as good. Maybe even better. So, yeah, it explained the ugly album cover art. It explained the name. It explained a lot of stuff. This is an actual original book. This came out in 1970-something. What year did this come out? 1973, right around the time that Devo was starting to come together. Oh, man, look at these, the great titles. Oh, boy, we've got uh, The Collapse of a Theory, The Newcomer Without a Memory, The Empty Skulls, The Damaged Brain, The Origin of Races. There's a lot of juicy tidbits in here, brothers and sisters. Great song titles right there in just the table of contents, let alone the contents of the book itself. So, yes, Treasured Artifact from 1973, very important to the Devo canon. Now, in a similar vein, let's see, we got all kinds of comments and stuff going on here. This is awesome. Similar also in uh, theory content and relevance to the origin of Devo was a whole series of weird religious pamphlets that came out of Ohio in the early 20th century. They were written by a guy named B.H. Shattuck. And the titles alone and the cover art alone are very evocative. Here's one called The Toadstool Among the Tombs. Great front cover art. Very intriguing back cover art and philosophy. Here's one about mistakes that God did not make with more excellent, excellent art on the front and on the back. And then that's pretty cryptic. The optimists were misguided. This is what happened. What next? I mean, it makes you want to read it, doesn't it? This is one of his tamer books, Man the Harness Maker. It still has really great, great graphics on the back. How would a blind hound know which way the rabbit went? Etc., etc., etc. Very cool. Here's another one I really love. Puddle to Paradise. Yes, Puddle to Paradise by B.H. Shattuck. Great front cover. Great back cover. These are all original religious pamphlets from the around the year 1910 out of Ohio. As wonderful as these are... I think you can probably guess what's coming next. <clears throat> the Grand Poobah of All of Them by B.H. Shattuck from 1910 out of Ohio. The author of Puddle to Paradise, Mistakes God Did Not Make, Man the Harness Maker, The Toadstool Among the Tombs, his masterpiece, his crowning glory of religious pamphlets, Jocko Homo, Heaven Bound, King of the Apes. I don't need to explain or say any more to you people out there who know your Devo. Jocko Homo on the front, and more great art on the back. This is an original, an original part of my personal collection. And I'm not going to take this original and crack it open, so I want to keep it well preserved. But I will take this copy. I thoughtfully reprinted Jocko Homo. I made a whole run of these in a handy digest size. So I'll crack open this display copy and show you some of the great artwork that lies within, including, besides his page after page after page of extremely purple prose, this fantastic diagram of what happens when you, belong, when you believe in de-evolution. you got to study this one very carefully. Awesome. I do, by the way, have multiple copies of the reprint of Jocko Homo for sale. Talk to me if you want one or two or three or more. You can buy as many as you want and pass them out to innocent strangers. Leave them laying around the neighborhood. Um, find your local meeting of uh, free thinkers and 
give them to them. Make them see it your way. All you gotta do is buy them from me. I will have these for sale at Devotional, along with a whole bunch of other cool stuff relating to Devo. <coughs> uh, let's take a look here. Oh yeah, we got the comments. I'll be checking these comments out after I, after I sign off. And of course, once the uh, once tonight's episode is posted on my YouTube channel, boom! Comments invited. The final item I've got in my pretties shelf that I'm going to show to you guys tonight, just because I only have so much time in the day. Another one of those things that's just so arcane and so bizarre and so out of context that it worked when... I bought my first copy ever of the first Devo album in 1978. As we all know, Are We Not Men? We Are Devo. With that front cover image of the grinning golfer with that giant golf ball behind him. That was some bizarre looking thing, man. That was just downright weird. One of the reasons why I knew I had to buy that record. I knew, just looking at that cover, that I needed to own that record and I needed to hear the music contained in it. Once again, no explanation of what that image was, where it came from, why it was there. It was just like it, it was just like a meteor that dropped out of the sky and landed in the viewer's head. But there was an antecedent for it. Yes, an antecedent. And as usual, it took many, many years in a completely random chance sighting in the wild before I saw what the source was. And then many years to finally acquire one of those objects to sit on my pretty shelf. Here's the big reveal, guys. You ready? We're going to do this in the great classic tradition of no budget cable TV. You might wonder what it was. Where they, uh, where they steal that imagery from? Well, from this object right here that's dropping down before me on the screen. What is it? What is it? What is this thing? I'm sure if we have any golfers out there, they will recognize this. It is a it's a golf club cover. You put that over the head of your golf club. What the 2-5 means, I don't know, because I'm not a golfer. <laughs> but I do know that this particular brand of golf club cover manufactured by Kent Manufacturing of Kent, Ohio in 1973 was personally endorsed by none other than Chichi Rodriguez himself. Yes. Do you see that? Yes, that is where Devo got the cover graphics for their first album. And before that, for the Be Stiff single that came out in the UK. The Be Stiff single used the actual graphics verbatim, <coughs> without alteration. By the time that the album came out in the US, it had been altered considerably. But this, my friends, is the source. And there's actually a very, very good video out there. I think it's called When Chi-Chi Met Devo or something like that. It's on YouTube. It was put out by the Golf Channel. And if you just look up Chi-Chi Rodriguez slash Devo, I'm sure it'll come up. And it gives, it's like about a 20, 25 minute video. And it gives a very detailed and very entertaining explanation of how Chi-Chi's image came to be used for a Devo album. And I love it because it actually for once gives um, it gives the opposition a voice in the narrative. The opposition being the people who worked for Warner Brothers at the time. Very interesting to hear their perspective on the whole thing. I'm not going to be a spoiler. I'm just going to say, look it up. Devo, Chichi Rodriguez. Great mini documentary on the making of the album cover of Are We Not Men? We Are Devo. And, you know, I could go on and on and on and on, but I'm not because I'm about out of time. I still have some practicing of my set to do for Friday night. Still got to pack the car. 
I got a, got a lot of things to do, so I'm going to do them all. I'm going to sign off now. Um, I'd say the odds are 50-50 as to whether or not I'm going to be doing Tent Talks Tunes next week. Because my plan is to go to Michigan from Ohio for a couple of days and visit a bunch of record stores. I always have boxes of stuff on my label, TPOS, that's a hint, that I take to record stores that are cool and clued in and do some wheeling and dealing. So I expect to do a lot of wheeling and dealing while I'm out there in the Midwest. Should be back by Wednesday, but I'm not going to guarantee it. So I'll, I'll keep you guys posted. <clears throat> in the meantime, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. It's always my job and my joy to talk to you folks about music and artifacts and culture and get to see what you guys have to say and get a good dialogue going on. Lots and lots of great fun. And um, if I don't see you guys or any of you people at the devotional this weekend, I'll see you somewhere down the road. Maybe when I'm on tour with Tim Holehouse from October 12th to the 19th. Maybe when I'm tour with Anti-Scene between November 3rd and approximately the 23rd. Maybe somewhere on the internet. I don't know. But wherever it is, until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State. <laughs>